Hi, this is Ms. Nicholson, and we're going to be looking at activity 19 on inverse trig functions. Uh, we're going to create some graphs, uh, parent graphs for inverse cosine, inverse sine, and inverse tangent, and then kind of apply them to a few example problems. Before we get into those inverse trig functions, um, I'd like for us to start by filling in a table of values for uh, the cosine function. What I'd like for you to do is pause the video, see if you can fill in this table without looking at your unit circle. All right, if you were successful, hopefully your table looks like this. Um, if it doesn't, you need to be studying that unit circle. But um, we're going to use these points to help us sketch a graph for inverse cosine. Now remember, whenever we're uh, trying to determine an inverse function, what we're going to do is take the x and y values, and we're going to flip them. The x's become y's, the y's become x's. The inputs become outputs, the outputs become inputs. Um, and you can see, if you take a look at the grid that I've given us to graph on here, notice that I've got the x-axis labeled uh, with numbers. The y-axis is labeled with, these are also numbers, but they're special numbers. They're radians. They're the angles uh, that we're used to seeing on the x-axis when we're graphing trig functions. But since I'm graphing an inverse trig function, those angle radian values are going to be on the y-axis. Uh, so let's start here, 0, 1. It's the x, y for cosine x. If I flip them, uh, then that point is going to have the coordinates 1, 0. And so 1, 0, that's going to be out here. Now, graphing this, uh, sketching this graph, it's going to be a little bit awkward because we're not going to be plotting the points from left to right. Uh, we're going to kind of follow this table. It's going to feel a little bit awkward, but I think once we get into it, you'll see the pattern. Pi over 4, square root of 2 over 2. Um, we're going to use the approximation 0.7 for square root of 2 over 2 uh, to sketch this graph. And so uh, that's going to be my input value, 0.7, my output, 0.4. And I'm counting by pi over 2 here, so pi over 4 uh, would be about here. Pi over 2, 0 is going to become 0 pi over 2. 3 pi over 4, negative 0.7. Uh, so I'm going to go to negative 0.7, 3 pi over 4, about here. Pi, negative 1. I'm going to flip those. Negative 1, pi. Um, negative 0.7, 5 pi over 4. Which is going to be here. 3 pi over 2, 0 is going to become 0, 3 pi over 2. 7 pi over 4, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 7 pi over 4 when I graph it. And finally, 2 pi, 1 is going to be 1, 2 pi. I don't think I quite got that point in there, maybe a little bit higher. Okay, so again, I know that was a little bit awkward, but if we connect these points, hopefully you can see, um, you know, that it is the cosine function, uh, but it has been inverted. Now, I did say it was the cosine function. What we are looking at here is definitely not a function. Uh, you can see that we're repeating output values um, all along here. But let's go ahead and fill out our grid. Um, in fact, it would be a nice little challenge if you want to pause the video and uh, take a moment just to finish sketching out this graph, see if you can follow the pattern uh, for the negative portion of the y-axis here. Okay, so the finished graph uh, should look like this. Um, again, we are not looking at a function here, uh, but we do want to interact with uh, inverse cosine as if it is a function. We want to use it like a function. And so what we need to do here is restrict the range so that we don't have any repeating output values. However, when we choose that restriction on the range, we have to make sure that we're including the full domain. So if I look at my graph and, and determine the domain, the lowest points on the x-axis that are included here are at negative 1. And then the farthest we go on the x-axis is to positive 1. So my domain is negative 1 to 1, which should make sense because that's the range of cosine. Um, 
And so I need a range that includes all of those points, but doesn't have any repeating output values. And so if you focus in just on this part of that inverse cosine graph, you can see that I'm including all the values from negative one to one, but I don't have any repeating output values. This little piece of the function, or I'm mean, sorry, the piece of the graph that I've highlighted passes the vertical line test. There's no repeating outputs. It is a function. And so this is uh, something we're going to need to remember, that if we have g of x equal to inverse cosine of x, the range, this is the important part, the range is going to go from 0, our lowest value here is 0, and the highest value is pi. So 0 less than or equal to the function g of x less than or equal to pi. That's our range, or if you prefer interval notation, zero to pi. All right, we're gonna do similar exercise for inverse sine. Go ahead and pause the video, fill in that table without looking at your unit circle. And hopefully you were successful with that. Uh, so now let's uh, switch our X's and Y's and plot these points to get a graph for inverse sine X. Um, I'm starting with zero, zero. If I flip, switch the X and Y, it's still going to be zero, zero. So we're starting here. Uh, pi over four, square root of two over two. Again, that's still 0.7. So I'm going to go to 0.7 pi over four here. Uh, pi over two, one is going to become one pi over 2, 3 pi over 4.7 is going to be 0.7, 3 pi over 4. So from the points that we're graphing, there's our first repeated output value. So we're not going to end up with a function here. Pi 0 is going to be 0 pi, another repeated output. 5 pi over 4, negative 0.7. So I'm going to go to negative 0.7. 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, negative 1 will be negative 1, 3 pi over 2. Hopefully you can see that pattern happening, um, negative 0 0.7, 7 pi over 4, and then 0, 2 pi. And so if I connect these points, we end up with a relation for inverse sine. Again, not a function. And the same pattern would continue um, down into this negative portion. And of course, if I did that too quickly, you can pause the video. But there we go. Our inverse sine graph, not a function. So again, we want to limit the range so that we include all the values of the domain and all the values of the range without repeating any of them. Now, if I look at the range we had for inverse cosine, zero to pi, for this graph, uh, that would be, um, let me see if I can cover them up there, just this part right there. And you can see if I limit, if I make that my range, well, it's not a function because we have uh, a lot of repeated values there. So inverse sine is going to have a different range. And uh, we do want to include this part, the first quadrant. But then how do I finish it out? We're going to finish it out by including this part. And so now that uh, piece of the graph that I've highlighted includes the full domain, starting from negative 1, going to 1. It has all the values of the range. <coughs> with none of them being repeated. So if the function is equal to inverse sine x um, for the range, it's starting at, and I'll go ahead and label this value on the graph, it's one unit down on the y-axis counting by pi over 2's. So negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Or if you prefer the interval notation, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2.
And I just remembered, I forgot to point out uh, this typo, but hopefully you uh, saw it or knew where I was going earlier. This should have been uh, filling in values for sine x, not cosine x. Sorry that I failed to point that out. All right, we're going to now get a graph for inverse tangent. Now for this one, instead of creating a table of values, um, I'm just going to use the tangent graph from our previous video uh, to help us out. So uh, this is our parent function for tangent. When we uh, sketch the graph of inverse tangent, again, our x's and y's are going to switch. And I want to start by talking about these asymptotes. Here on tangent, if I have an input value of pi over 4, the output is undefined, and we ended up with a vertical asymptote. Did I say pi over 4? I meant pi over 2. Um, input value of pi over 2 gives me a vertical asymptote, an output of undefined. If I flip those things, it's kind of a weird concept to think about, but if you look and, and just notice that I've got those radians labeled on the y-axis, Hopefully it makes sense that that asymptote is still going to happen at pi over 2, but since I'm doing an inverse, it's going to be horizontal instead of vertical. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2, which means I'm going to have another horizontal asymptote at 3 pi over 2, which is going to be here. Also at negative pi over 2, if we want to continue the pattern on down into the negative portion of uh, this graph and at negative 3 pi over 2. So these vertical asymptotes that we saw in the parent function of tangent, they become horizontal asymptotes here. Uh, now let's plot some points. Uh, 0, 0 is an easy place to start because if I switch them, I still get 0, 0. Um, here we have the point pi over 4, 1. So if I switch my x and y, that's going to be 1 pi over 4. So here's 1 pi over 4 would be right here. And let's see if we can think about it now. <clears throat> um, we know these two points are going to connect. And just like whenever there's asymptotes, that graph wants to get really close to the asymptote. And so it's just going to keep going and approach that asymptote even though it is horizontal. If I go uh, down into the negative portion, I guess we do have one point here. Um, this would be at negative pi over 4, negative 1. So if I flip those, it's going to be at negative 1, negative pi over 4. And the same thing is going to happen that this graph is going to Go through, connect 0, 0 to negative 1, negative pi over 4, and then continue approaching that asymptote. And so you can kind of see that same, it's a little hard to draw because I got it so stretched out, but we've got that same kind of flow going here that we see in the tangent graphs between those asymptotes, except they're going horizontal. Now this pattern is going to continue to repeat. Going to have the same points like that. Oh, this is so stretched out. It's difficult to draw it correctly. I'm almost making it look too linear. There we go. Sorry about that. And same thing down here. Okay, so uh, here, uh, again, not a function. We are not passing the vertical line test. We need to restrict the range uh, with tangent, and hopefully it makes sense that we would just take one of these pieces between the asymptotes. We always want to include those first quadrant values from the unit circle. And so to finish it out, um, we're going to use that part there. So for inverse tangent, our range is the lowest point is negative pi over 2. 
less than f of x. Notice I'm not saying less than or equal to because this is an asymptote and this is never, the output is never going to be equal to negative pi over 2. Um, f of x less than and then our highest part on the range is pi over 2. So again, those are values that we need to keep in mind and remember. For inverse sine and inverse tangent, the range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. For inverse cosine, the range is 0 to pi. So uh, let's use these things to help us uh, work a couple examples down here. If I need to know the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. So this is a ratio you should be familiar with from your unit circle. With inverse trig functions, whenever that's the function uh, that I'm using, my output should be an angle, a radian value, because those, those are the things that we've been graphing along the y-axis here. My out should, output should be the radian value whose sine is square root of 3 over 2. And hopefully you know, if you need to look at your unit circle, do, but hopefully we know that that happens at pi over 3. Because sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2. So inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2 is pi over 3. Similarly, inverse cosine of negative 1. Well, what angle has a cosine of negative 1? That, of course, would be pi. Now, when we um, write these output values, we do need to be thoughtful about whether or not this value is included in the range. For inverse sine... Uh, pi over 3, it is definitely between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, so we're good there. And for inverse cosine, um, pi, it's the end point of the range, but it's still included there. And so, uh, so these values are good. But notice here I have inverse sine of negative square root of 3 over 2. Now, if you look at your unit circle, uh, the first angle, if we start at 0, make our way around, uh, in the positive direction, the first angle that we come to whose sine is negative square root of 3 over 2 is um, 4 pi over 3. Because sine of 4 pi over 3 does equal negative square root of 3 over 2. However, this angle 4 pi over 3 is way outside of the range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so what we have to do is we have to find an angle that's in this range that also has that value of negative square root of 3 over 2. Well, um, negative, it's going to happen down here somewhere, somewhere between 0 and negative pi over 2 because that's where, uh, that's where we have our negative inputs. They also give us negative outputs. Since it is square root of 3 over 2, we know it happens at pi over 3 angles. And... So this is going to have to be a pi over 3, and it's going to be negative. If you think about your unit circle, if I go to negative pi over 3, which would be roughly right here, negative pi over 3, that's actually going to be the same as uh, 5 pi over 3, which is not the angle we wrote for pi over 3, but it's coterminal with 5 pi over 3, and the sign at that angle would be negative square root of 3 over 2. So if we're using this as a function, negative pi over 3, that's going to be the output because that's the value that's within the range. Inverse cosine of negative 1 half. Um, if you go around your unit circle, that, of course, happens at uh, 2 pi over 3. And if we think about the range for cosine, 2 pi over 3 is still in this range, 0 to pi. And uh, so we don't need to find another coterminal angle to, uh, to make this result work because that is in the range. So just be careful about that. Your outputs have to be within the range for the function. Now here we're doing inverse sine of sine of pi over 3. And when you think about inverse functions, they undo each other. And what you would hope is that those would just kind of cancel out and we would be left with pi over 3. Well, let's see if that happens. Inverse sine of the sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2. And the inverse sine is square root of 3 over 2. We already figured that out. It is pi over 3. So pretty cool. It looks like maybe they just undo each other and we're left with uh, the input. Let's see what happens on this one. Cosine of inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. Well, 
the inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. That's going to happen at 3 pi over 4 because cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2. I'm thinking about my range for inverse cosine, and 3 pi over 4 is there between 0 and pi, so that's okay. Cosine of 3 pi over 4 equals negative square root of 2. So again, looks like when we have these two functions, they're just going to undo each other. But let's look and see what happens on this last example. The sine of 5 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2. So then if I want to do inverse sine of negative square root of 2 over 2, I need an angle whose sine is negative square root of 2 over 2. 5 pi over 4 is certainly a candidate, but it is not in our range for the inverse sine function. I need an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. I know it's going to have to be pi over 4 uh, because it's going to, that's where sine is squared to 2 over 2 at all the pi over 4 angles. And since this is negative, then to stay within my range, it's going to have to be negative pi over 4. So in this last example, you can see that these two things don't always just undo each other and leave you with the original input. What matters is if this input is in the range for that inverse function. And in this case, it was not. And so we had to find that coterminal angle that's within the range to uh, give us the correct output for this function.